people? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, what was I talking about? Oh, this dumb book I wrote. So, uh, have I been talking a half an hour? We must have started late, right? Yes. yes. Okay. I just, <coughs> just, wow. Anyway, so, I decided I'm going to write this book on the color blue. And one of the things that happened, you know, and, and it became a book about Impressionism. Um, and the Impressionists, the French Impressionists, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is I, I um, if you stay, Impressionism happens for a number of reasons. You know, everybody, it's soft pictures of, of uh, fields of flowers and pink-cheeked little girls and water lilies and dancers and whatnot. And it's, it's like, oh, it's a wussy, non-edgy kind of art. Art people, modern art people are like, eh, the Impressionists, rah, 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 rah. And um, that's really not the case. It's, there's an edge to it, but you have to know context. But one of the reasons that impressionism, hap impressionism happens in the mid-1850s is that paint starts to come in tubes. Up until, you know, 1825 and after, paint came in like dry pigment and you had to mix it with linseed oil or water or fresco or whatever, plaster. And then you made your own paint, and you had, and, or it came, if it was already mixed, it came in sheep's bladders. And once you opened it, there was no way to keep it unless you put it in jars. So it was all done, all painting was done. Where's my tissues at? In a, um, I thought I had some. No, it's not your fault. I'll go get, I'll go get them and it'll kill time. Um, I, I'm allergic to public speaking, and this always happens. Um, anyway. So, so you had to do all your painting in a studio. Even the landscapes of like Constable and all those famous landscape painters from England, they sketched outdoors, but they didn't paint outdoors. And then, but paint comes in tubes. So now, <laughs> everything starts to look like art. So, um, I'm kidding. Um, so, so now painters can go outside and paint. And if you look, you know, now, the, and, the, and the whole sort of motto of the Impressionists was to paint what they saw, not what the Academy told them. And I'll, I'll tell you about that history part of it, but what they were actually looking at. So they were painting outdoors for the first time. They were painting daylight um, in ultraviolet light, which is what color blue. So if you stand in a room full of Impressionist art, whether it's little pink-cheeked girls or water lilies or landscapes, there's an overall cast of blue to it. And so in writing a book about the color blue, I thought that's where it'll go. And then, of course, I read about the circumstances of Vincent van Gogh's death, and I went, nobody paints a masterpiece, stops, shoots themselves in the abdomen, and then walks a mile to the doctor. That's not... You know, that's not an effective suicide. <laughs> Vincent was a very smart man. He may have had emotional problems, but he wasn't a dumbass. I mean, that's word. And, and since I finished the book, there's actually been a biography that came out that said, yeah, we're pretty sure it was murder. And so I thought that's where the book begins, even though Impressionist doesn't begin until, well, it begins in 1863, and I'll tell you why what happens. Painting. Everything about painting was for 500 years the church told everybody what they had to paint or nobles told people what they had to paint because you would get a commission from a noble to paint you know, his history or his battles or his family and so forth. And then there was a secular revolution in France. Unlike ours, it wasn't, I mean, they emptied the churches and filled them with grain and they took the royal palace, which was the Louvre, and made it into an art museum. And the French Academy suddenly said, this is how you have to paint. And they're the guys that still exist to this day that get really angry when English words work their way into the French vocabulary. And they're like, oh, we don't have a hamburger. We <laughs> <laughs> just have to say hamburger. Um, although they say the other part in French. Um, so, so the academy was saying, okay, you could paint, you know, you couldn't show brush strokes, and everything had to come from dark to light. And you had to paint mythical settings. You could paint, say, a nude woman, but it had to be Venus or Psyche um, or Athena. You couldn't just paint the chick in the apartment downstairs. <laughs> um, and then Cinco de Mayo happened. <laughs> and everybody drank Corona. 
I thought for years, as probably many dumbass Anglo people who live in California <laughs> thought that Cinco de Mayo was Mexican Independence Day. No, no. Here's what's happening in France. Um, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, who is the Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew, is running France in the 1850s. And he's had a little bit of success in war with, with the Austrians. And he sees there's some stuff going on on the North American continent, namely the Civil War. There's some action he wants to get in on. And he's feeling a little cocky. And he says, you know what I think I'll do? Is I think, you know, why not? I'll attack the Mexicans. And so, and this is like 1861 or so. And then like on 1862, May 5th, as a matter of fact, 1862, the Mexicans kick nine shades of shit out of the French. <laughs> and it becomes a Mexican national holiday, which is really not Mexican Independence Day. It's, boy, did we kick the shit out of the French. <laughs> so what's happening back in, in France is the, the French, particularly the Parisians, are not really happy with their leader. You know, when you just sort of start a war for no reason whatsoever and then get your ass kicked, it makes you unpopular. You guys may know what I'm talking about. Um, so the salon is how you become a painter. In, in the eighteen in the mid-1800s, if you wanted to be a painter in Paris, it was a completely legitimate way to make a living. It was, you know, I want to be a banker, I want to be a tailor, I want to be an accountant, I want to be a painter. There were 18,000 professional painters in Paris in 1850. But you had to exhibit at the salon, which was chosen by a board, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, a bunch of guys, a jury of the academy members. And then you would be, once a year, exhibited in a royal palace, in a big palace, a public palace, uh, by the salon, in what was called the salon. And so in 1863, the academy rejected 3,000 painters, which meant those guys now can't make a living, because if you didn't get exhibited in the salon and your work didn't sell there, you couldn't get commissions. And, and the Parisian public was up in arms about, wait a minute, you just have all these guys that you know, got to this high level of skill. And remember, this is a very active social cafe world in Paris at the time. You just rendered them unemployable. You know, it was like taking eight, you know, 3,000 doctors of literature you know, and going, you can't teach. Um, and they, uh, or whatever doctors of literature do, <laughs> heal Jane Austen. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so so um, Napoleon III said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. We'll do a salon of the rejected. And all those painters that were rejected will be in another palace. And in that big giant collection was a painting called Luncheon on the Grass. I won't say it in French because every time I do, someone corrects my pronunciation. So just think it to yourself if you know. Um, and all it was was two guys sitting on a riverbank with a naked woman and some chick who looked confused in the background. And there was that year, there were hundreds of nudes in the salon, but this was shocking because it was the chick in the apartment downstairs. It was a Parisian woman, and she was looking right at you, and she's like, yeah, I'm naked. <laughs> Only in French. Um, <laughs> and there were a bunch of young painters there, and they had all been talking about painting modern life and painting what they saw. There was Monet and Renoir and Degas and Cezanne and Pizarro, and they saw this painting, and they said, this changes everything. We're going to paint what we see. We're going to paint modern life. We're going to paint our impressions of things, although that term won't come to them until 1873. Um, and they did this in defiance of the salon, knowing they wouldn't be able to make a living at it. They pursued this idea of painting their world and painting what they saw and getting paint down on canvas. Monet believed that you had to capture the moment and you couldn't work on any single painting outside for more than an hour because you were paint, trying to paint light that didn't exist anymore. And he was famous for lining up 12 canvases by the cathedral at Rouen and painting for an hour on this one and then moving to this one and then moving to the next one. And he would do the same thing with haystacks. So when you see those paintings, those you know, dozens of paintings of haystacks, they were all made almost at the same time because he didn't believe it was the same light that he was trying to capture. And that comes through really profoundly in some of his work later on that, that I talk about in the book. So 
that's really where the edge of Impressionism comes. It's not this pink-cheeked little girls and the fields of flowers. It's the fact that they were going against what was the survival instinct. This was, we could conform. They all had the skill. You know, particularly Renoir, who was probably the least remarkable of the Impressionists, but the most skilled as far as realistic painting goes, a classic painting. Um, they all had the skill to, to be painters in the salon, but they decided to go against that. And that's what puts the edge in these sort of soft pictures of pretty little girls and fields of flowers, and that's what attracted me to this subject to do this book. That and when I started doing this writing thing, I thought I was a horror story writer. <laughs> and so um, I took my horror stories to writers' conferences and people laughed at them. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's what I do. So about, the, so about this time, the late 80s, um, there was this guy named Kirby McCauley, who was the, they called him the super agent to the stars. He was Stephen King and Dean Koontz and Peter Straub's agent. He was, you know, all the big horror writers were, uh, were represented by him. And he did an original anthology of short stories, horror stories called Dark Forces. And in the introduction he says, the reason horror has been successful for 200 years, since Mary Shelley's Frankenstein basically, is because you can combine horror with any element and it will work successfully. Hmm. Except whimsy. <laughs> you cannot write a successful whimsical horror story. <laughs> and I said, what does he know? <laughs> and I set out to write a book called Practical Demon Keeping, which is a whimsical horror story. And here I am, you know, 22 years later, and, you know, the sixth New York Times bestseller, and, you know, that's why I relate to what those guys did. Because in spite of anybody else's good judgment, I went ahead and tried to do what you, they said you couldn't do, what the people who were supposed to know said you couldn't do. I don't put myself on par with the Impressionists, but I get it. You know, so anyway, that happened. 